Welcome to the eOrganic webinar on using small grains as forages on your organic dairy. My name is Deb Haliba and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as eOrganic's dairy team coordinator. eOrganic is an online community of more than 700 ag service providers and farmers who are providing science, experience, and regulation-based certified organic information on the web. Together we publish articles, videos, and other content at eExtension.org. This webinar is part of an ongoing series focused on certified organic dairy production systems. You can see more information about these webinars. Um, find a recording of today's <coughs> webinar and view other content on our website at www.eextension.org slash organic underscore production. So before we get started, I wanted to give a quick rundown of today's webinar. Heather will give her presentation for about 45 minutes. And then we'll ask you to respond to three quick poll questions that will appear on your screen. And then next we'll hold a question and answer session with Heather for about 30 minutes. So if at any time you have a question, you can simply type it into the question box on your screen and hit return. Um, if you can't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. And we will answer as many questions as we have time for. Finally, we ask that you respond to an email you will receive following the webinar <coughs> to complete a follow-up survey. Okay, now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Heather Darby is an agronomist at the University of Vermont Extension and also leads our eOrganic dairy team. She received her Master's of Science degree from the University of Wisconsin in agronomy and her PhD in horticulture at Oregon State University. Heather has uh, developed applied research and outreach programs in the areas of fuel, forage, and grain production systems in New England. Her extension and outreach programs have focused on soil health, water quality, nutrient management, organic grain and forage production, and oil seed production. Her research, all of which is conducted on farms, has focused on traditional and niche crop variety trials, cover cropping, reduced tillage, and weed management strategies. Heather was raised on a dairy farm in northern Vermont and with her husband is now the sixth generation to operate her family farm where they grow organic vegetables as well as operate a custom grazing <coughs> operation. Heather, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Deb, um, and thanks everyone for attending. As Deb mentioned just a second ago, I'm going to be talking about um, adding annual forages. She said grains, but I decided to also um, add in summer annuals as well as cool season annuals to give a kind of broader perspective about the opportunities for using annual forages on your farm. Now I am an agronomist so I'm going to be talking about producing the forages mostly focused on the applied research that we've conducted at UVM and uh, showing you both yield and quality data as well as some of the production information, other production information we've gather, gathered see here if I can go to the next slide. So we have a lot of goals um, in mind when we started these projects. Mostly <clears throat> we were talking to farmers around Vermont and people were you know looking for ways to reduce grain purchases. I mean just to, to put it frankly. Um, trying to reduce their reliance on paying for grain and so we're always looking for ways to produce high quality forages on our farms so that we can buy less grains. One of the options for producing higher quality forages um, is perennial cool season pasture or stored feed that we're all very familiar with such as you know growing orchard grass or clover or alfalfa but what I'm going to talk about today is adding in other high quality high yielding annual forages uh, into your cropping system. Let me see here. Stick it down. Um, hmm. Well, it's n not moving down. Hold on one second. There we go. All right. So we have, besides reducing reliance on purchase concentrates, the other thing or goals that we're trying to meet is we're trying to always figure out how we can extend the grazing se season. Um, how, can, how can we get the cows out of the barn earlier in the spring and how can we keep them out on pasture as long as possible into the fall and even into the winter 
And again, um, it keeps the cows outside longer, but it also reduces the time that cows have to be inside eating stored feed and concentrates. And then hopefully by doing all of this, we're adding value um, to Muted. forages that we already grow. So maybe we can supplement on either end of our normal pasturing season. All right. So we've conducted several research projects on farms around the state of Vermont and also at Borderview Research Farm in Alberg with different goals in mind, all of them focused on annual forages again. The first project we had is investigating the feasibility of grazing winter cereal grains and then potentially taking another harvest um, of those same grains for either forage or, or grain and straw. Um, so these are winter seeded or fall seeded grains. Okay. Um, in our experiment, we planted, planted these spring grains on September 16th. We've done this for a couple of years, actually. And the fall seeded grains that we looked at were, were wheat, Zero and Maxine, as well as triticale and winter barley. Now, we seeded these at 125 pounds to the acre, again on September 16th, with a grain drill. And then the next spring, we looked at what kind of yields we would get by grazing the forage. And you can see grazing in this sense is in quotation marks because it was simulated grazing. These were small research plots looking at the, basically demonstrating the concept. But at this point, we were not using um, real animals. So just one note, so everyone knows that the barley for us in the two years that we conducted this trial, which were 2009 and 2010, overwintered very poorly. And this is very common. It's very difficult to get winter barley. The primary variety that's used is McGregor or Thoroughbred um, to overwinter in the Northeast. In both years, we saw um, anywhere from 40 to 50 percent survival. Um, and so, again, this is obviously a barrier if you want to try to use winter barley in the Northeast. It doesn't overwinter as well as triticale or wheat. Okay, so we planted these forages, these cereal grains, in September the following year, and then we waited to see at what time uh, were they ready to graze, and we were looking for them to reach uh, 8 to 10 inches worth of growth before we would simulate um, a grazing. And in year one, I'm sorry, year one and two, uh, we actually were able to the forages were ready to graze on April 23rd and in the second year, May 1st, okay? And then what we did was we went back to the plots after the first graze and took a second graze or we harvested them for forage or we let them go for grain, okay? So the first graze we were able to take April 23rd um, and May 1st in, in the following year. <clears throat> they were ready to regraze, so they grew back on May 3rd um, and May 12th. And for us in the Northeast, for a lot of us, that's about um, one to two weeks earlier than when the cows normally go out on cool season pasture. Generally, at least in uh, Vermont, on our own farm, we aren't really putting the cows out until about May 15th. So this would give us a couple extra weeks of grazing before perennial forage. Oops, let's see here. So, sorry about that. I'm getting a little trigger happy with my, my mouse here. So this is our simulated grazing. So you can see we just used, um, that's a cow, not really a cow. It was a jerry mower, it's called, and it's got a sickle bar mower on it. And we would go out and mow the plots. This was the first graze um, early on in the spring. Mowed it, collected it, weighed it, um, and tested it, tested it for quality. And again, waited for it to grow back. Um, when it grew back, we either harvested it as a second grazing, as I already mentioned, um, or we let it go to boot stage for a forage harvest, or we let it continue on for grain, for grain and straw harvest. And you can see in the two years that we did this, it reached the boot stage on May 24th and June 1st. Um, and in the terms of grain, it reached grain harvest July 23rd um, and August 6th. All right, so now if we look at 
some of the data we collected, you can see that um, the first graze that we took, we were able to harvest 898 uh, pounds of dry matter. Okay, We let it regrow, and when we let it regrow and grazed it again for a second time, we got an additional 1,130 pounds of dry matter. Okay, Or when we harvested it a second time for forage, we got 2,927 pounds of dry matter. Let me move my slide here. They don't always move very fast. Here we go. Now, if you combine these, again, we're looking at a system here. So if we're grazing twice, okay, we're getting about a ton of dry matter in this system. And if we're grazing uh, once and then harvesting it for forage, we're getting almost um, two tons of dry matter. So you can see there's a big difference and how much feed you'd be able to harvest from that acre. Again, what you decide to do um, on your farm will be really highly dependent on what your goals are. So if you just want to graze it twice um, because you want to get the pasture value of it, that's great. If you graze it once um, and then you want to take some for a stored feed, maybe it gets by you before you can graze it again, um, then you'll also get quite a bit of dry matter from that. So there's some flexibility in the system. Okay. I'm sure, there we go. Um, you can see the protein of the forage was relatively high um, at the first grazing, very similar to <clears throat> what you would see in a cool season pasture, very high protein, 20%, and that actually started to decline. The second grazing was slightly less, although not significantly different. And then when we harvested it for forage, as you can see, the crude protein declined down to about 14%. And that's pretty common. We see that in most any grasses that as they get ready to head out, the protein declines. And when you harvest something in the vegetative stage, the protein is generally higher. Okay. Sorry for the delay, I'm just waiting for the slides to change. Now again, when we look at um, neutral detergent fiber or the fiber concentration in the plant, again, you can see the first time that the crop was grazed, um, the fiber was obviously the least. And as we waited um, and let the small grains go for forage in the boot stage, you can see that the amount of fiber increased considerably. And again, this is pretty standard. Um, developmental uh, that we see for all grasses. As they get older, they get more fiber. Change the slide. Unmuted. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry again here, trying to get the slides to move. They don't seem to want to move. Okay, now when you look at the different grains themselves, so we have two different varieties of wheat, the Zorro and the Maxine, um, of muted triticale, um, and then also the winter barley, which was thoroughbred. You can see that the wheat and the triticales uh, yielded the same, and the barley yielded significantly less. And again, that's most likely due to the fact that we lost a good portion of the barley um, through winter kill. So you would see less yield, obviously, because there's fewer plants there. Okay. Unmuted. Heather, can you click on the screen and maybe you can um, move mouse? Yeah. Aha, there we go. Thank you very much, Alice. Muted. So what I wanted to do was compare the winter cereal pasture, which is to the right here, to cool season pasture and look at the differences in yields from a first graze. So <clears throat> these were not in the same experimental plots. This is actually data that was collected by Sid Bosworth um, in, in long-term um, grazing studies, looking at average yields of cool season pasture across the state of Vermont during the first graze. So you can see right away that a winter cereal pasture uh, grazed does yield 
uh, slightly more than a cool season pasture on the first graze. And we've seen this same results over the two years of our project. Ah, oh, that works much better. Thanks, Alice. And then you can also see that we are actually able to take, potentially take two grazings before we even go out to start our first graze of pa cool season pasture. And so therefore we're getting about a ton of dry matter before we'd even put our cows out on cool season pasture. So that's the potential here, um, again, to be able to get a few weeks of early season pasture before your cool season pastures are ready to be grazed. So wonderful. Okay, so um, we took the next step <clears throat> with this study. We wanted to see if this would actually really work out on a farm, um, and we worked with Earl Fournier, who's a dairy farmer in West Swanton, Vermont, and we conducted a what I call a real grazing study. Here's the cows to prove it. They're out there eating um, fall seeded triticale in April of 2010. You can see how, well, they're kind of standing around, but they really liked it. Um, and we don't have a lot of time to, to talk about all the details of this project, but you can get on our YouTube site, and the address is right there, and you can actually watch two videos about, about Earl um, and his project with grazing fall seeded triticale. Okay, so, so what happened? Okay, these were seeded in uh, the 20th of September of 2009, and really the, the goal for Earl, just to give you sort of a real life situation how he was thinking about this, was that he wanted to reseed an old hay field, it was mostly orchard grass, and he wanted to seed it into some perennial rye grass and clover. And in order to do that, generally he would fall plow the, the old sod and let it sit there all winter and then work it up the next spring and put down his new seeding of forage. So instead of just plowing it up and letting the sod sit there over the winter, he decided that he would um, plow it up, prepare the ground, and seed the winter triticale um, and with the hope of actually being able to harvest it the next spring as a pasture before he put down his new seeding. So the next spring in April, if everyone remembers last year, at least in the northeast, we had abnormally warm temperatures in early April. We had 80 degree weather April 3rd um, for about three or four days. And the triticale was really ready to be grazed um, April 15th. Um, and Earl was ready to put his cows out there. And then we received a couple feet of snow or so <laughs> and were unable to put the cows out. So the triticale actually started to get ahead um, of where the cows really wanted to graze it. Uh, the cereal grains grow really fast. It's un, a little bit unlike cool season pasture. They, they just grow like gangbusters under these cooler temperatures. So what we actually saw when Earl was able to put the cows out there was that they uh, were wasting a lot of the feed because it had started to elongate. And if anybody knows about cereal grains, it basically had started to send up its shoot at which, you know, further in its life it would send out its flower head. So this is just, um, we actually looked at what the cows were grazing versus what was left ungrazed. And you can see they were just nipping the tops off. They were still getting about 1,300 pounds of dry matter per acre, 20% protein. You can see how digestible the fiber is and the high NEL of this forage. And you can see what they were leaving was um, the bottom portion of the plant, which was still, uh, basically they're leaving behind almost a ton of dry matter and the lower quality forage. So these cows are way smarter. Um, well, I guess we already knew that, but they take the good stuff and leave the um, not so great stuff there. Let me get to the next slide here. Here's just a picture that shows you exactly what they were chomping off. They were basically just taking these nice tender leaves and kind of leaving the stemmy part there. Um, so it looked really great in our research studies that we would be able to go out and graze it and then potentially go back in and graze again um, and or take a cutting of forage. But what happened in Earl's case was that it got ahead of him. It got ahead of the cows 
and he was able to graze it, got some really high quality feed, he was happy with the milk production, very excited about it, um, couldn't actually go back in and re-graze it, but again was, was very happy because not only did he have a winter cover on that sod field, but he also got some feed off of it. Um, it really helped break down the sod, he said, and this is all in the video, um, and then was able to seed it down. So, you know, again, I know there's some interest, and in what might actually work better, and I've seen this on O'Dairy lately, is uh, trying to actually graze the fall seeded cereals in the fall lightly, um, and then <clears throat> grazing them again the next spring. And so we'll hopefully be doing some more work on that scenario as well. Go on to the next piece. Okay, so the other thing we've been looking at is using these fall seeded grains for a forage. I talked about that just briefly. Um, so what we're going to go over a little bit are the types of grains that you can seed for forage, when to plant them, the seeding rate, and when, when to harvest. All right, again, um, this is from a different study in 2010. And just to show you what I was talking about before, the winter barley doesn't survive quite as well as the winter wheat and the trit triticale, but they can all be fall seeded. Also, your list here would include rye and spelt as well. In the northeast, a crop like oats does not overwinter. Okay, um, planting date. If you're planting a fall seeded cereal to actually take as a forage the next season, this just shows you some results that we've seen. The earlier you plant, the more forage you end up with the next season, to a point, of course. Um, we found that if you can plant in mid-September, um, we commonly see about 3,000 pounds of dry matter per acre, and this is um, basically right before the boot stage, okay? And, you, and I'll show you some more data. But really the point here is to show you that if you wait out into late October, especially in our area, you are really going to um, have difficulties overwintering the crop and potentially end up with a lot less yield the next spring. Seeding rates. Now, the goal here is to get... Um, you know, plenty of forage the next year, and again, we have seen that if you use slightly higher seeding rates than you might with a, a just a normal cover crop, you'll see more dry matter production the next season. And our data basically shows 125 to 150 pounds to the acre. Okay, seeding the grains um, in our neck of the woods, we don't have a lot of grain drills. Um, that would be I, an ideal piece of equipment to use to plant the cereal grains, but we have looked at other ways to get a good stand, um, in this case of a cover crop, but it would apply to forage um, or grains as well. So what our farmers have done is they've gone out and chisel plowed the ground and then broadcasted seed. Uh, we're also using airways to seed these grains. Um, at different angles. So you can see this airway at a 15 degree angle is very aggressive and that would work up the soil the most. And then these are different um, levels of aggressiveness down to an airway at zero degree angle um, to just broadcasting the seed on the soil surface and doing nothing. So you can see there are many other ways to get a, a decent stand of cereal grains, but a, of course a grain drill would work the best. All right, so a little bit of data that we've collected. We're basically looking at harvesting these fall seeded grains in the boot or the soft dough stage. The boot stage, again, is um, you can feel the grain head in the plant, but it hasn't yet emerged, okay? Um, and in the soft dough stage, the head's actually emerged. Um, it's flowered, and it's actually filled the grain with starch, but it the starch is very soft. And if you take the kernels off and you mush them between their fingers, they'll make a little, little bit of dough there. Okay? So the boot stage is still you know, right before the head comes out. And the soft dough stage, you're actually um, forming grain, but you're not harvesting it yet as, in, um, as hard grain. Okay? So as you can see here, harvested in the boot stage, 
you get less yield. Okay, um, and what we found is that the wheat and triticale, we can still see considerable high, considerably high yields in the boot stage. This was last year in 2010. And with the barley, we saw about half as much yield. And again, that's probably because of the fact that it doesn't survive that well over the winter. If you wait until to harvest in the soft dough stage, you can see that the yields um, double in most cases. Okay, so the plants are getting bigger, there's more biomass there, and the yields are higher. All right, so how does um, harvesting at each one of these stages impact quality? If you harvest in the boot stage, um, and again, you can relate this back to your perennial uh, cool season grasses, if you harvest your cool season grasses before they head out, we all know that you're going to get higher protein than if you let them head out. It's the same way with cool season grains. So again, harvested in the boot stage, you can see the protein of these grains is you know anywhere from about 11 up to 13 percent protein. Um, and in the soft dough stage, you can see the protein declines you know to nine, eight percent protein. Okay. And um, in our study, we've seen that um, there's a, some difference between the grains, as you can see in the, in the photo here. All right. That's, that's, there we go. Um, one of the biggest differences we see and why people sometimes choose to harvest in the soft dough stage is because you're actually getting some starch. Um, and some non more non-fibrous carbohydrates. So you're actually filling the grain and there's more starch in that plant than there is harvesting in the boot stage. Okay, So you can see non-fibrous carbohydrates um, doubles when you harvest in the soft dough stage. So again, you're getting more starches and sugars when you wait to harvest in the soft dough stage even though your <clears throat> the straw portion of the grain or the, the leaves and the stalk are actually starting to dry down and lose quality, you're gaining quality in the head. So you can sort of think of it like corn silage in a way, right? When corn silage de develops, um, if you harvested the corn silage when the grain <clears throat> before the ear filled, it wouldn't have very much starch in it, but as the ear of the corn starts to fill, obviously you get more carbohydrates and the, it's the same thing with the small grains. Okay, um, again this is looking at just across all the grains, boot yields versus soft dough yields and again like I mentioned before, um, harvesting the soft dough gives you double the yield. If you look at quality, you can see that the protein in the boot stage is the highest higher than in the soft dough stage, but again you can see the non-fibrous uh, carbohydrates are double in the soft dough stage. Okay. Um, another really important thing to note um, is that when you harvest in the stop, soft dough stage, if you're making a round bale or something out of this, um, it's already at 60 percent moisture. So you actually don't need to wait for it to dry in the field versus when you harvest in the boot stage Again, you're at you know 80% moisture, and you need to let it dry down before you bale it up or whatever you're going to do to store it. All right, we've also looked at spring grains. Um, so we've been talking about fall seeded grains, but we've also planted spring grains. Basically, we try to plant them in April. That's not really working out this year for us too well, but uh, last year we planted our spring grains April 15th. Um, who knows what it'll be this year. And we're looking at oats, <clears throat> triticale, barley, and spelt. Excuse me. And we have here on the list, we have spur oats, which is actually a grain oat variety. Um, Everleaf oats, which is a forage oats. We have an oats plus mix, which is a commercial uh, mix that's oats and annual ryegrass. And then we had a forage triticale, a forage barley, and um, and a forage spelt. And so you can see um, that these sort of standard oat varieties seem to yield the highest 
Um, this oats mix with uh, ryegrass and the triticale were the second highest yielding, and the barley and spelts um, were about a thousand pounds or so less. All right, when you look at the quality, uh, what we generally see is that um, barley, or what we have seen is that the barleys, the barley and the forage oats, as well as the spelt, have, ver have the lowest um, fiber contents um, and some of the highest digestible fiber as well. Okay? And that in terms of net energy of lactation, what we're seeing or what we've seen over the last two years is that our for forage oats have the highest net energy of lactation. A lot of farmers I know um, will go to the feed store and pick up a bag of oats, um, feed oats or horse oats or whatever it is to plant. And I would really suggest that if you want to get the most quality out of it and the most yield, um, specifically ask for some of these forage oat varieties. They have been bred and developed um, to have high yield and very high quality. All right, another thing that we um, wanted to look at with the spring grains is actually seeding them with forage brassicas. So we took the forage oats, the everleaf oats, and we mixed in um, a few pounds of, of barcant turnips and we took the spelt and we mixed in a, the same thing, some barcant turnips into those and we did the same thing with triticale. Um, and you can see there was no significant difference um, in yields by doing that. They all yielded about a, um, <clears throat> about a ton of dry matter per acre when harvested in the boot stage. Now if we looked at and if we compared the quality, so you know our theory was that if we added brassicas into the mix we would see an improvement in quality because the brassica, forage brassicas are known to be sort of concentrate like um, with really high protein and low fiber. Uh, what, what we saw when we averaged across all the different forage types was not, not really much difference um, in protein, so here is the annual spring forages with, with no turnips and those mixed with turnips and you can see very slight, very, very slight increase in protein but not significantly different um, and again like a slight decline in fiber but not significantly different. Um, so the brassicas are expensive and what we saw mixing them uh, with the grains and harvesting in the boot stage we just didn't see a huge um, difference in forage quality. Now I will say I don't have time to show you all the data collected and you can get the whole report on my website, but um, we did see a big difference uh, when we waited to harvest the grains in the soft dough stage or in the milk stage. Okay, <clears throat> I guess I already showed that, keep going. Okay, and here's the net energy of lactation when you look at um, the turnips added to the spring grains. And again, you can see here <clears throat> that for uh, whatever reason, it seemed as if, especially this particular variety, the Paja turnip, had a negative impact on the NEL, okay? Um, where the barcant turnip didn't see, there was no difference between the oats and the barley. So we need to do some more work on this because there's a, a big difference between the forage brassicas um, in their quality, especially with this paja turnip and the barcant turnip in this particular study. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, double crop systems because uh, this spring grains and the fall seeded grains harvested for forages are actually generally harvested in June um, or even real early July and then you have the whole rest of the season uh, to grow another crop and so what are the options for you to add a crop behind that system and get even more yield and, and quality per acre. So we actually grew our spring grains 
um, and our fall seeded grains, and behind them we planted the summer annuals. Here's a picture of the plots, um, and the summer annuals you know as um, sorghum, sorghum sedan grass uh, hybrids, um, or Sudan grass, and also Japanese millets and pearl millets. So we've been looking at those uh, double cropped behind the spring grains. <clears throat> Last year we conducted a, um, a sorghum sedan grass variety trial, and here are five commercial um, BMR sorghum sedan grass varieties, and we were able to get two cuts. These were planted in uh, late June, and you can see we didn't see a whole lot of diff. We didn't see any difference actually in yield between these five sorghum sedan grass varieties, and the highest yield we saw was about 11,000 pounds of dry matter per acre across two cuts. We were cutting these again; they're about four feet, maybe a little bit taller, um, depending on the weather and when we could get out there and mow them. So you can see we got the most yield from the first harvest and about half half the yield from the second harvest. But in the end, we were right around 10,000 pounds of dry matter per acre. If you look at the quality, <clears throat> the protein that we saw was about 13%. We didn't see a big difference in quality among these different varieties. Again, they were all BMR varieties, so very highly digestible forage contents, as you can see here. Um, they do have a lot of fiber, obviously, as you can see here, with 60% NDF, which is very high, but um, a good portion of that fiber is digestible. Okay. The other thing we wanted to look at is mixing the sorghums and the millets with uh, turnips as well. There actually is a commercial mix available that's Japanese millet, um, and I want to say it's T-Raptor um, rape. So we wanted to see if adding turnips would increase the quality of the summer annuals and the yields. Um, what we actually saw was that adding turnips to the sorghum sedan grasses reduced the yields. Um, and that was consistent for all the varieties. So adding in the turnips, there was some more competition in there. Um, and so we, we saw a pretty, pretty significant reduction in yields versus just planting all uh, sorghum sedan grass. Okay, and then when we look at quality, what we did see was that if we added turnips, we did see an increase in protein, um, about you know one percentage point, a little bit more than that, and we did see a decline in digestible or in fiber content, um, and not significant, but a little bit of uh, increase in digestible fiber as well. Okay, now we also looked at the millets. Um, <clears throat> this was in a different experiment where we were comparing the Japanese millet to the sorghum sedan grass and you can see we didn't see a huge difference in yields between um, the millets and the sorghums but in both cases when you mix the summer annuals with turnips we saw a decline in yield and when you look at the quality um, the biggest thing that you'll probably notice here is that the millets have much higher protein than the sorghum, and we've actually seen this, and again, this is a different experiment, um, but we've repeated this two years in a, in a row, that the millets generally seem to have higher crude protein levels than the sorghums, um, and then when we added the turnips in, we saw a slight increase um, in protein in the millets um, and a tiny bit with the sorghum. Okay. So the other crop that people are, seem to be really interested in um, to extend the grazing season is a fall seeding of brassica plants. Um, <clears throat> and we conducted a variety trial last fall where we seeded five different brassica varieties on August 16th. And again, this is in um, northern Vermont. We used a five pound per acre seeding rate. Now, we were on a budget, <laughs> a low one as usual, but um, so we weren't able to take multiple harvests 
uh, but we did record that the, the first time the brassicas reached or when they reached a 10 inch height was in mid-September, um, but we didn't take our harvest until mid-October. Um, I believe it was October 20th, okay? And by that time, they were, you know, depending on the variety, two to three feet in height. So theoretically, you would have been able to at least been on your second grazing of these brassicas, but again, unfortunately, we didn't have the funds to, um, to look at that. But there's a lot of promise um, with these brassicas, I feel. So here's just a picture of the five uh, brassica varieties that we looked at. T-Raptor, which is a, a hybrid uh, rape, which I think is, um, they've taken off the market now. This Paja turnip that um, we didn't, we tested it last year. We didn't like it at all. We saw a decline in quality when it was mixed with the other grains, so we thought we'd look at it separately, see what was going on there, compare it to the other brassicas. This Barcant turnip, which is very popular, widely available uh, forage turnip. Bonar rape, which was my personal favorite, and I'll tell you why in a second, and this ape and turnip. All of these um, are commercially or were commercially available last year. <clears throat> I like the bonar rape for no other, <laughs> no other reason um, other than the fact that it had very smooth leaves, and the other um, brassica varieties were very prickly. And again, we're just hand harvesting these with mowers, and we didn't have cows out there. It would be really interesting to have the you know, funds to be able to go out and put some animals out there and see which one they would pre prefer. But to me, the bonar rape um, would just be nice and smooth on the cow's mouth. <laughs> so I'm curious about how, <clears throat> how the ca animals would select these out in an actual grazing system. We did look at yields, and the highest yielding, uh, we didn't see a huge difference in yields, but bonar rape did yield the highest, over 3,000 pounds of dry matter per acre. And again, this was one harvest, um, October, uh, September, know, I'm sorry, August, September, two months after we planted. And so we had about a little over 3,000 pounds of dry matter. And then T Raptor was the lowest yielding. And again, uh, apparently that one's going off the market anyway. But good amount of yields for all of them, um, about a ton or more pounds of dry matter uh, per acre. You can see the protein. Again, the, the highest protein we saw was the ape and turnip, where we saw 24% um, crude protein, and then the bonar rape, where we were over 20, and the lowest protein where it was the Barkant turnip and the Paja um, hybrid, both below 20% protein. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to try to compare the brassica quality. And again, we, we didn't have a whole lot of funding to do this. We probably should have done wet chem, but we didn't. So the, these are NIR values. And if I did it again, I would use wet chem um, to get maybe a little bit better sense of this, but I compared this to our university uh, forage testing lab results uh, from first cut haylage, legume haylage, and then corn silage, and just looked at how brassica, these brassicas compared to our other forages. And again, you know, they, they had really high protein. This is on average across all of them. But um, notably, very, very low fiber content, and we know this already about brassicas. Um, and, you know, and then also um, a net energy of lactation of about 0.65, not as high as corn. But again, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that would change if I, if I used NIR. But still, really high quality feed, very low fiber. The other thing people say about brassicas is that they um, <clears throat> have a lot of or high nutrient content, so I thought I would put this up here. My table's a little bit messed up, it looks like, but um, one of the things I noticed here was that we get about 2% calcium, um, and the interesting thing about that is that uh, legumes have a high calcium level. The one from our testing lab, about 1.8. 
uh, with grasses being quite a bit lower, one and less than one. So the brassicas have pretty high calcium levels. The other thing I thought we should note here is that they also have really high potassium levels. So this definitely is not, you know, a feed probably for your dry cows um, that you're trying to um, reduce potassium um, in their feed. And again, these reports are all on our website, so you can really kind of take a deep look into all the results. Um, and again, I was just comparing the calcium. We hear about this a lot. People want high calcium feeds. So again, just comparing these to our forage lab, you can see how high the brassicas are in calcium. Okay, and I'm getting uh, close to running out of time. But I also um, wanted to talk a little bit about double cropping these small grains with corn. We've done that in a project with uh, Dr. John Jemison at uh, the University of Maine. And we've had really good success. So if you look at this table, um, basically if you harvest your winter seeded grains in the boot stage, here's winter barley in the boot stage, here's triticale in the boot stage, and wheat in the boot stage, right? We're basically able to plant corn uh, right around the beginning of June after we take a boot stage harvest of these grains. That's not too late in northeastern uh, Vermont or northern Vermont. We also looked at harvesting the small grains in the soft dough stage, and that had us planting corn at the end of June, uh, which really is too late for us here in most places. But there really is a potential to plant corn um, after these small grains. And this is just a little bit of data showing you the yields that we've gotten. So this is corn planted after boot uh, stage harvested grains or soft dough stage harvested grains. You can see we got higher corn yields um, planting after boot stage harvested grains again because we're able to plant earlier. Okay, and when you look at the quality of the corn, you can see that we have much um, better quality corn silage if we plant it earlier, essentially. So for us, um, harvesting grains in the soft dough stage and then planting corn probably isn't very feasible, but harvesting in the boot stage and then planting corn is definitely a possibility. And again, if you just look at the total yields per acre that you could get, this is our full season organic corn, 15,000 pounds of dry matter. Um, this is the boot stage grains with the corn, and now we're up over 20,000 pounds of dry matter per acre. Okay? And soft dough, we saw the most yields, but the corn was um, not fully mature when we harvested it. Okay, just going to skip over this. And this is just showing the different grains that we used. Not a whole lot of difference. Uh, we saw a slightly higher dry matter yield when we grew wheat um, and double cropped that with corn, but not a whole lot of difference there. Okay, the other notable item that you'll see here is that we looked at weed biomass um, in the corn. And you can see with a full season corn, no grains before it, we had higher yields, or higher weed yields, proud of that, <laughs> higher weed yields um, than when we planted these winter cereals. Okay, so planting a, a winter grain, harvesting that, and then planting corn can also reduce um, weed pressure in, in the corn. All right, so just a couple other points before I end here is that um, annual cropping systems, it's not a very good summary slide, um, there's just a lot of flexibility there. There's lots of crops you can grow, many different ways to harvest them. Um, the amount of dry matter you can get off the fields is very substantial. I, I just kind of put this, um, the sorghum sedan grass, uh, combined with dough stage harvested fall grains, which is much more feasible than um, corn with dough stage harvested small grains. I mean, we're talking about 21,000 pounds of, of dry matter yield per acre, plus some really decent quality feed. Um, so again, you know, I would really encourage people to, to uh, 
you know, try out these different annual forages. They can fit into the cropping systems, your perennial cropping systems, nicely. Um, we have many farmers that are grazing sorghum as well and really like that, especially during the summer slump of perennial cool season grasses. So again, there's lots of potential here to diversify your forage system. Um, this is just the site in, in, uh, at Border View Research Farm of our applied research um, and education program. We have about 2,000 research plots here, all focused on topics important to the farmers. Um, and at this farm, we have uh, 30 acres of certified organic land um, that we use. Here's the website I was talking about. We also have uh, many videos, a YouTube channel. You can follow us on Facebook, um, and you can also follow our um, Twitter, by Twitter. Thanks. <laughs> you want that. And then this is our crew. want to give everybody credit. Um, Deb's not in here, so I apologize. Deb Haliba, who's our fearless e-organic dairy coordinator. Um, and then uh, much of this research was supported through the Organic Valley uh, FAFO uh, program, and I really uh, appreciate their support and also Northeast SARE as well, um, and the many farmers that conducted trials on their farm, uh, Roger Rainville at Borderview Farm, Eric Paris uh, in Lindenville, Brent and Regina Beidler, Peter Miller, and Earl Fournier, and, and many more folks as well. So that's, that's it. So I guess we're ready for questions. Thanks, Heather. Um, so before we do move to our question and answer period, um, we'd like to ask um, our participants to complete a quick um, poll. So we have three questions for you, and the first one's popping up now. Um, we're going to just keep those on the screen um, for just a few seconds so you can answer them. So if you could just go ahead and click on the response to this question. Um, you know, as a result of this webinar, do you now have a better understanding of how grains can be used as livestock forages? So if you can go ahead and click on, and then uh, we'll just move to the next one real quick. Okay. Our second one should be popping up. <coughs> there we go. So do you know what resources are available to help you learn more about small grains production? If you could just pop on one of those quest, uh, responses, that would be great. We'll just keep that open for just a few seconds. And then we have one more. Okay, that one's going away. And the final, our final question. Uh, will you add grains into your livestock operation or change the way you advise farmers based on what you learned today? You could just uh, respond to that question, then we'll open it up for, for our question and answer period. And while um, we're just finishing up with that quick poll, I just wanted to let folks know that I did um, in the chat the chat box um, post uh, Heather's um, YouTube channel and her uh, website, which has the the research reports um, to which you re referred to. Okay, all right. So thanks for um, responding to those quick polls. Um, so now it's time to have some um, questions from you. Um, so as a reminder, um, if you want to ask a question, you're just going to find the question box, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. You'll just type in your question and hit return. And um, if for some reason that question box is closed, there should be a little um, uh, plus sign right next to the word question. You just want to click on that, and it will open it up for you. And how we conduct the Q&A session is I'll read the questions out loud to Heather, and she'll answer as many as we have time for. Okay? And after the webinar, if you have additional questions, you can just go ahead and use our online Ask an Expert system at um, uh, eextension.org slash ask, and the URL is right up there on your screen. Okay? So Heather, well, there's a few questions already in the queue, so we will not delay. Um, First, um, could you just give us a sense of the climate, rainfall, et cetera, where, you, um, where you've done your crop testing? Um, the climate. So Let's rainfall, annual rainfall, that type of thing. Yeah, annual us. rainfall. I can tell you exactly what it was last year <laughs> from our research reports. Um, it's a temperate climate, and I would say that we 
Um, usually, uh, let's see, you know, we have anywhere from, um, you know, 2100 to 2800 growing degree units a season, depending on where you are. And, you know, just calculating, I guess, rainfall from, um, you know, across the growing season for us being maybe April through September, we're looking at, um, I don't know, 15, 15 inches just through that time. But usually, you know, across the whole year, it would be maybe 30, 30 plus inches. I don't know if that helps. But um, I would say that we typically are, um, I don't know what else to add to that, I guess. No, I think that's good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That, uh, that should give us a sense. Thank you. Um, so the next question says, we have heavy clay soils and lots of rain, but without much freeze. Um, would you, under those conditions, would you expect a lot of pugging with, with grain production? And then any ideas um, of what we could plant that would create enough, heavy enough sod to protect the soil during grazing? Um, so in terms of the small grains, many of our, our producers that are growing grains in Vermont that are on heavy clay, they usually grow fall seeded grains um, because, you know, we, we generally have enough dry weather in the fall um, that you're able to get the grain seeded. Now, it's true, you know, the weather is highly, you know, that's what drives us for all, everything that we do, really. And, you know, that was part of the problem in Earl's system was that we got two feet of snow, it was really wet out, um, it got a little bit by him, you know, a lot was destroyed, it wasn't able to regrow. So um, my recommendation, I guess, at this point would be that I think more likely, unless it's really dry in the fall, um, you might be able to get out there and take a light grazing off a small grain that was planted in, in uh, mid-August um, and then let it regrow and be able to graze it just again in the spring and that would be that would be it. But yeah, if it's wet, a lot of it will be destroyed by the animals and won't grow back. But if you're on clay soil, I would recommend using a fall seeded grain for forage, not a spring one. Great, thanks. Um, have you uh, observed any performance um, differences between the small grain sorghum double crop system and the full season corn silage in a drought year? In a drought year? Um, both the years that we conducted this trot trial, one year was extremely wet um, and cold, and the other year, last year, was actually very hot and droughty, um, and we didn't, we didn't really see a difference between the two systems, I would say. Both of them like, you know, warm weather, both corn and, and sorghum, so no, we didn't see a difference. Okay. And have you um, done any research or know um, uh, if the uh, forages that you um, were testing cause any flavor changes in fresh milk, particularly the uh, brassicas? Yeah, I have not done that research. That is a concern, and I believe there probably has been some work done, particularly with brassicas. My, you know, sort of my gut feeling is that that wouldn't be their whole ration that they would be eating and that it would be, you know, it's a really high... It's a low, 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 low fiber diet, um, lower than any of the other forages that we'd be growing or grazing. So you would be supplementing with something else, and um, I, you know, I, I don't foresee it would make a huge change in the flavor if you were feeding other components. But I don't know for certain. Okay, thanks. So, what are some of the best options for high NFC for interseeding cool grasses? For Interseeding cool grasses, we to do. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, there was some work conducted. I don't know um, where the results went, but I know at the University of Maine, um, and I believe Rick Kurzbergen was a part of this project. They were interseeding grains and brassicas um, and some of these annual crops into cool season pasture. Um, I think it was difficult to get get them established because generally when people are management intensive grazing, they have a really good stand of forage that's really competitive. 
Um, so I, I guess I don't really have a good answer for that. But if somebody has an idea, it'd be great to hear it. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see. So um, with the uh, Sudan sorghum, Sudan grass sorghum study, um, when did you harvest those in the, the summer forage? She's yep. Asking. Um, okay. I gotta remember exactly when we did that. We harvested them, so they were planted in June. Her actually early June. I'm gonna tell you exactly when we did it because I have the data sitting right in front of me. Um, we harvested the first cut July 20th and the second cut August 30th. How's that for an answer? <laughs> great. That's a great answer. <laughs> and is there is there any reason why these forages could not be used for goats? Uh, not that I can think of, but I am not a goat nutritionist, so um, I'm not sure if they're more sensitive to any of these crops. I mean, of course, you know, the big uh, concern with sedan grasses and some of the sorghum sedan grasses is that they have prusic acid in the plant, so they can cause prusic acid poisoning in livestock, but um, you know, that's why it's recommended that they're harvested or grazed when the plants are 36 inches or taller, and also that you're not grazing them after a frost, because a frost actually concentrates um, the prusic acid. So that, that, from what I know, is would be the biggest concern, and of course, I have actually also heard that brassicas can have um, some negative impacts on sheep, but I don't have any more details than that. Okay, great. Um, any, uh, let's see, I think we might have answered all of the current questions in the, in the question pod here, so if anybody has other questions, please pose them now. Um, and while you're doing that, um, so, you know, actually we have Rick Kersbergen on um, participating in this webinar, and he, um, you had talked about the interceding with the cool, on, with, on cool yep. grasses, and he said um, he concurred that we had a bit of trouble establishing into existing sod, as you had indicated, so. I have, I, I will comment that um, on my own farm once, we had some brassica seed. I don't know where we got it. We had a couple pounds of it, and we threw it out into the pasture to get rid of it. We didn't see anything happen. Um, and then all of a sudden, that fall, in some of the bare spots, there were lots of brassicas growing. But, you know, I don't know if we could replicate that. I imagine if you had a pasture that was failing and had some bare ground, you could probably get something established. But it, actually, that responds to a question at, at, which asks them, are you using small grain or brassicas on your home, home, home yeah. dairy operation? Yeah, we haven't used um, any small grains ourselves, um, but there are a number of farmers here in Vermont that are, um, that are using the small grains as forage and then also um, to graze and also using summer annuals quite a lot, actually, especially the millets. A lot of people seem to like the millets and organic systems. They seem to be um, a little less finicky. Well, speaking of millet, um, <laughs> this person asks, um, you mentioned Japanese and pearl millets, um, and this fellow has heard that Japanese millet can be a weed. Um, do you think that pearly millet has any advantages for that? Or we had, we didn't see it. Yeah, I, I haven't seen, I mean, again, where we are, it's not a weed. It doesn't go to seed, um, and it, that's how it spreads, you know, through seed production. We're harvesting everything so early um, that, yeah, we, have, we haven't seen any, any issues. Um, and I haven't, we didn't, in our trials, and again, if you look at the whole research report online, you'll see all the results, and we didn't see any yield differences or really any quality differences amongst the different types of millets. Okay, great. Um, this person asks, how can we try to balance the high degradable protein in cool season and provide a grass legume with bypass protein? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> 
my title is an agronomist. <laughs> <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask a question that had to do with nutrition, and I'm hoping maybe Rick Kurzberg, and since he's on the line, might be able to, um, nope. what do you get? You got off as soon as he was asked the first question. But, um, you know, I, I don't know um, that answer specifically. So it's a legume and, you know, with high, the high soluble protein, is that what it was? Can you read it again? Um, yes, um, it says, how can we try to balance the high degradable protein in cool season and provide mm -hmm. a grass legume uh, with bypass protein? Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, that would really be a question for someone that has, I could get myself into trouble, so I would prefer not to answer a question it, like it, that. Rick says you can't, is his response. Oh. Well, good, that's <laughs> similar to what I was going to say. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rick. Um, all right, so next question is, any thoughts or observations on sub summer weed suppression by barley residue left as uh, field trash? Summer weed suppression of barley residue left as field trash with nothing planted into it or just? Um, maybe um, we can get that clarification. You know, in our project where we were with John Jemison, where we were looking at planting corn after harvesting the small grains, there was no residue there. Um, the weed suppression, you know, benefits obviously came when the crop was growing and um, when the small grains were growing and you had less weed production, but also planting slightly later helps. <laughs> yeah, I guess he was talking about the next crop. Um, you know, specifically. Would you see area. some suppression? If you had residue, you might see some suppression. Okay. Like sort of like a roller crimper type. It would depend how thick it is, and how, you know, obviously, if you were no tilling into it or not. Okay, great. Um, would the brassicas have having such high K values? Uh, would that be a viable way to decrease K in soils? Well, I mean, it's. No, because it's just taking what's out of this, decreasing K in soils, is that what they said? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, right. Any crop that can remove a lot of potassium, um, like this crop, obviously, even though the amount, you know, you, so legumes remove a lot of potassium for the so from the soil, like alfalfa, for example. We always have to give alfalfa a lot of potassium um, because it takes a lot to grow that crop. But when you're harvesting alfalfa, you're harvesting it multiple times, um, and you're re actually removing it from the field. Um, so you can reduce potassium levels pretty quickly by growing a crop of alfalfa. But with the brassicas, um, you have a lot less biomass or dry matter yield. And uh, my assumption is that um, you wouldn't put that forage up as a stored feed. It would just be grazed, and then the cows would probably be, you know, just digesting and manuring it back on maybe on that field depends so it could I guess if you actually removed it from the field okay um, this farmer is from southwest Washington state and she gets 40 inches of rain <laughs> um, and so she, um, her questions about uh, nutrient washing issues yep. um, for winter pasture, so she's trying to winter mob graze stockpiled pasture. If trying to build protein in winter forage, do um, the winter wheat or legumes hold their nutrient value? The, you would lose a little bit, but mostly it would hold it, yes. But, you know, the crop that holds the most nitrogen is winter rye. You know, it's the best scavenger of all the winter grains but it's generally not considered the best forage, which is why we didn't include it in our studies. But yeah, they would retain, they would retain most everything that they picked up when they were growing. Okay, thanks. And speaking of winter rye, this person asks, um, can winter rye work as well as winter wheat or triticale in these systems? Similar palatability and yields? Um, it yields less. That Well, so you saw the yields, actually, when I was showing the planting date information. That was all winter rye. Um, and, you know, it has more flexibility, at least for us here. We can plant winter rye, 
you know, into October and still get it to establish. So there are benefits to using winter rye in terms of um, its ability to grow under much cooler and more adverse conditions than any of the other grains. Um, the yields can be, I would say they're a little bit less generally than some of the other grains. Um, they're not necessarily bred to be gr grown for forages like some of our other winter grains. Um, so they might be a little bit lower in quality. But they're more flexible. <laughs> So um, as a follow-up question, um, someone asked about winter rye. Why, why aren't they considered the best forage, it sounds like, because they're lower yielding? Well, it, again, it sort of depends. If you're not able to plant your cover crop or your winter, winter or fall seeded cereal, and again, I'm speaking from my Vermont experience, until October here, you know, forget planting barley forget planting triticale and you're really on the cusp of planting wheat. So, you know, if you really want to do something, then the only option you have is winter rye. It may not be the most superior one out there, but you're still going to get a decent amount of feed and it'll be decent quality, but it's not the absolute best. You know, we can't always plant the optimum thing. So, you know, my optimum small grain forage really is barley. <laughs> I love it, and if you look through all of our uh, trials, you'll see that it really always is the best quality feed, and it can really yield um, given the right conditions, but it doesn't like clay soil, and it's difficult to overwinter, so if you have those kind of conditions, even though it's the most optimum, you, you're not going to be able to grow it, so then you go to the next, you know, crop, so, you know, it's really thinking about your system, what fits best into your system. Um, you see the data there, you see, you know, what it has to offer. Um, so you have to decide what's going to work best for you. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, just one more sort of winter rye question. Um, can you spring plant winter rye or winter wheat? Um, it looks like um, this person is dragging pasture now and wanting to broadcast something, like right no. now. Okay. I mean, you can, but the thing about winter grains is that they need to go through a vernalization period to to really, um, I guess it depends what you want to use it for, but they have to go through a real cold vernalization period to basically elongate, so it would be very, there wouldn't be much there. It would grow, but not much. You wouldn't get much biomass out of it. Okay. Great. Um, so what variety of triticale did you use? Um, Try cow. I'm trying to remember. Oh, I can look for you. <laughs> There's a bunch of different varieties that we've looked at. Is this the win? Are you asking about the winter or the spring? Um, not. I'm not. Winter. Thank you. Winter. Okay. Give me one second, and I will look that up. But um, we've used a bunch of different varieties, and I have to say, when we first started this work. Triticale's come a long way because we weren't able to overwinter triticale, you know, it seemed four years ago. The varieties hadn't been developed um, to withstand the winters here. But over the last three years, um, better varieties have been released. So we use Trical 336, which has been a great variety for us here. Right, and, and oh, great, thank you. Um, any last question? We might have time for one more quick question. Um, okay, millet, is it a winter or spring planted? Uh, summer, actually, or early summer. It really needs warm soil temperatures. So, um, and when I say warm, 55, 60 degrees. So for us, you know, you get the best, really the best catch in, um, you know, mid mid June to end of June plantings. And last year we we planted in early June, but that's because we had abnormally you know high temperatures. 
Okay, great. Um, well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for your questions. Um, as I mentioned before, this webinar is part of our ongoing series at eOrganic, um, and you can find a recording of today's session um, on the eExtension.org um, website, which is posted up on your screen. We also have our, um, an eOrganic YouTube channel, so you can find this um, webinar up there as well. Um, Thanks, Heather, and thank you, Rick, for chiming in. That was helpful. Um, and uh, thanks, Heather, for joining us today, and thank you all for coming. Happy spring. <laughs>